Chapter 1 The Eternal and Temporary Dharmas of the Jiva Within this universe, the middle planetary system, shaped like a lotus flower, is known as Burmandala. In Burmandala, there are seven islands which extend outward in concentric circles, like the whorl of a lotus flower. At the center of this whorl is the island of Jambadweep, which is super excellent among all the places in Burmandala. In Jambadweep, the land of Bharadvasha is eminent. Within Bharadvasha, the topmost place is Godabhumi. Within Godabhumi, the nine island region of Sri Navadweep Mandala is supremely distinguished. And in one area of Sri Navadweep Mandala, a beautiful settlement named Sri Godruma is eternally situated on the eastern bank of the Bhagirati River. In ancient times, many stalwart practitioners of Bhajan lived in the various places of Sri Godruma. It was here that Sri Surabhi, a cow of divine origin, previously worshipped the Supreme Lord Bhagavan, Sri Gaurachandra, in her own kunja, a grove shaded with fragrant flowering creepers. At a little distance from this kunja is Pradumna kunja. Here Sri Premdas Paramahamsa Babaji, a shiksha disciple of Pradumna Brahmachari, the best among the associates of Sri Gaurachandra, now lived in a kutia, hut, covered with vines and dense foliage, and spent his time constantly immersed in the divine rapture of Bhajan. Sri Prem Das Babaji was a refined scholar and was fully conversant with all the conclusions of the Shastras. He had taken shelter of the forest of Godrum with single-minded conviction, knowing it to be non-different in essence from Shinandagram. As a daily routine, Babaji Maharaj chanted two hundred thousand holy names and offered hundreds of obeisances to all the Vaishnavas. Maintaining his existence by accepting alms from the houses of the cowherd men had become one of the regulative principles in his life. Whenever he found a spare moment from these activities, he spent his time not in idle gossip, but in reading the book Sri Prem Vivarta by Sri Jagadananda, a confidential associate of Sri Gaurasundara. At such times, neighboring Vaishnavas gathered and listened with great devotion as Babaji read with tear-filled eyes. And why would they not come to hear? This divine treatise, Prema Vivarta, is filled with all the conclusions of rasa, the condensed liquid essence of integrated transcendental emotions. Moreover, the Vaishnavas were inundated by the waves of Babaji's sweet, resonant voice, which extinguished the venomous fire of sensuality in their hearts like a shower of nectar. One afternoon, having completed his chanting of Sri Harinam, Babaji Mahashai sat reading Sri Prema Vivarta in his bower, shaded by vines of Madhavi and Jasmine, and became immersed in an ocean of transcendental emotions. Just then, a mendicant in the renounced order of life approached him, fell at his feet, and stayed prostrated in obeisances for a considerable time. At first, Babaji Mahashai remained absorbed in the bliss of transcendental ecstasy. But after a while, when he returned to external consciousness, he beheld the Sanyasi Mahatma lying before him. Considering himself more worthless and insignificant than a blade of grass, Babaji fell in front of the Sanyasi and began to weep, exclaiming, O Chaitanya, O Nityananda, please be merciful upon this fallen wretch. The Sanyasi Thakur then said, Prabhu, I am extremely vile and destitute. Why do you mock me like this? The sannyasi proceeded to take the dust from Babaji Mahashai's feet upon his head, and then sat before him. Babaji Mahashai offered him a seat of banana tree bark, and sitting beside him spoke in a voice choked with love. Prabhu, what service may this worthless person offer you? The sannyasi set aside his begging bowl, and with folded hands began to speak. O oh Master, I am most unfortunate. I have spent my time in Kashi and other holy places, debating the analytical conclusions of the religious texts, such as Sankhya, Patanjala, Nyaya, 
Vaisheshika, Purva Mimams, and Uttara Mimamsa, and exhaustively studying the Upanishads and other Vedanta Shastras. About twelve years ago, I accepted the renounced order of life from Sri Sachinandan Saraswati. Having accepted the staff of the renounced order, I travelled to all the holy places, and wherever I went in India, I kept the company of sannyasis who adhere to the doctrine of Sri Sankara. In due course of time, I pass beyond the first three stages of the renounced order, Kutichak, Bahutak, and Hamsa, and attain the highest status of Paramahamsa, in which I have remained for some time. In Varanasi, I adopted a vow of silence and abided by those statements that Sri Sankaracharya proclaimed to be the Mahavakya, chief axioms of the Vedas, Aham Brahmasmi, Prajnanam Brahma, and Tattvam Asi. However, the happiness and spiritual satisfaction that I was supposed to find did not come to me. One day, I saw a Vaishnav sadhu loudly singing about the pastimes of Sri Hari. I opened my eyes and saw that he was bathed in streams of tears, and that in his ecstatic rapture the hairs of his body were standing on end. He was chanting the names Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda in a choked-up voice, and as he danced, his feet slipped so that he fell on the ground again and again. When I saw him and heard his song, my heart filled with an indescribable ecstasy. Although that mystical experience was so overwhelming, in order to protect my status as a Paramahansa, I did not speak with him at all. Alas, fie on my rank and status! Cursed be my destiny! I don't know why, but since that day, my heart has become attracted to Sri Krishna Chaitanya's lotus feet. Shortly thereafter, I became obsessed with the desire to find that Vaishnav Sadhu, but I could not see him anywhere. Never before had I experienced anything like the untainted bliss that I felt when I saw him and heard the holy name emanating from his mouth. After considerable thought, I concluded that the highest benefit for me would be to take shelter at the lotus feet of the Vaishnavas. I left Kashi and went to the beautiful holy land of Sri Vrindavan Dham. There I saw many Vaishnavas uttering the names of Sri Rupa, Sanatan, and Jiva Goswami in a mood of great lamentation. They were absorbed in meditation on the pastimes of Sri Radha Krishna, and they rolled on the ground chanting the name of Sri Navadweep. When I saw and heard this, a greed arose within me to behold the beautiful holy dham of Navadweep. I circumambulated the 168 square miles of Sri Braja Dham and came to Sri Mayapur just a few days ago. I heard of your glories in the town of Mayapur, so I have come today to take shelter of your lotus feet. Please fulfill my life's aspiration by making this servant an object of your mercy. Paramahansa Babaji Mahashai took a blade of grass between his teeth. Weeping, he said, O Sanyasi Tako, I am absolutely worthless. I have uselessly spent my life filling my belly, sleeping, and engaging in futile talks. It is true that I have taken up residence in this sacred place, where Sri Krishna Chaitanya enacted his pastimes. But as the days fly by, I find myself unable to taste this thing known as Krishna Prem. You are so fortunate, for you have tasted that divine love merely by seeing a Vaishnava for just a moment. You have received the mercy of Krishna Chaitanya Dev. I will be very grateful if you will kindly remember this fallen wretch for a moment when you are tasting that Prem. Then my life will become successful. Saying this, Babaji embraced the sannyasi and bathed him with his tears. When Sanyasi Maharaj thus touched the limbs of the Vaishnava, he experienced unprecedented bliss within his heart. He began to dance as he wept, and as he danced he began to sing, Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya, Shri Prabhu Nityananda, Jai Premadas Guru, Jaya Bhajanananda. All glories to Shri Krishna Chaitanya and Prabhu Nityananda. All glories to my Divine Master Premdas and to the bliss of Bhajan. Premdas Babaji and Sanyas Thakur 
danced and performed kirtan for a long time. When they stopped, they spoke together on many topics. Finally, Premdas Babaji said very humbly, O Mahatma, kindly stay here in Pradumna Kunj for a few days, just to purify me. The sannyasi said, I have offered my body at your lotus feet. Why do you speak of a few days only? My anxious prayer is that I may serve you until I give up this body. Sanyasi Thakur was an erudite scholar of all the Shastras. He knew very well that if one stays in the residence of the Guru, one will naturally receive the Guru's instructions. So he took up residence in that grove with great delight. After a few days, Paramahamsa Babaji said to the elevated Sanyasi, O Mahatma, Sri Pradyumna Brahmachari has mercifully given me shelter at his lotus feet. At present, he lives in the village of Sri Devapali, on the outskirts of Sri Navadvip Mandala, where he is absorbed in the worship of Sri Nasringadev. Today, after collecting alms, let us go there and take darshan of his lotus feet. Sanyasi Thakur replied, I will follow whatever instructions you give me. After two o'clock, they crossed the Alakananda River and arrived at Sri Devapali. They then crossed the Suryatila River and took darshan of the lotus feet of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's associate, Sri Pradumna Brahmachari, who was in the temple of Sri Nishingadev. From afar, Paramahamsa Babaji fell to the ground and offered prostrated obeisances to his guru. Pradumna Brahmachari then came out of the temple, his heart melting with affection for his disciple. Lifting Paramahamsa Babaji with both hands and embracing him very lovingly, he inquired about his welfare. After they had discussed topics concerning Bhajan for some time, Paramahamsa Babaji introduced Sanyasi Thakur to his guru. Brahmachari Thakur said with great respect, My dear brother, you have obtained a most qualified guru. You should study the book Prema Vivarta under Prem Das's direction. Kiba Vipra, Kiba Nyasi, Shudra Kenanai, Jai Krishna Tattva Veta, Se Guru Hai. Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya 8, 1, 28. Whether one is a Brahmana, a Sannyasi, or a Shudra, if he is fully conversant with all the truths regarding transcendental knowledge of Sri Krishna, he can become a Guru. Sanyasi Thakur humbly offered obeisances at the lotus feet of his Parama Guru and said, Prabhu, you are an associate of Sri Chaitanya Dev, and you can purify hundreds of arrogant sannyasis like me just by your merciful glance. Please bestow your mercy upon me. Sanyasi Thakur had no previous experience of the reciprocal behavior between Vaishnavas. However, he accepted the mutual dealings that he observed between his guru and param guru as the sad achar, proper etiquette, that he himself should follow. And from that day on, he behaved accordingly towards his own guru without a trace of duplicity. When the evening arti was over, the guru and shishya returned to Sri Godruma. A few days after residing in the Kunja, Sanyasi Thakur became anxious to inquire about spiritual truths from Paramahamsa Babaji. By this time, the Sanyasi had adopted all the ways of a Vaishnava except for his outer dress. During his previous training, Sanyasi Thakur had developed qualities such as full control over his mind and senses and had become firmly established in the conception of the non-dual all-pervading absolute, Brahmanishta. In addition, he had now acquired staunch faith in the transcendental pastimes of Parabrahma Sri Krishna and had become deeply humble. One morning, after performing ablutions at the break of dawn, Paramahamsa Babaji sat in the Madhavi grove chanting Hari Nam on his Tulsi Mala. At that time, Shri Shri Radha and Krishna Yugal's Nishant Lila, their pastimes just prior to dawn, gradually manifested within his heart. Because this was the time that Shri Shri Radha and Krishna part from each other's company, leaving the Kunja to return to their respective homes, Paramahamsa Babaji felt great pangs of separation 
and tears of love streamed continuously from his eyes. While absorbed in meditation on this pastime, he was internally engaged in service, appropriate for that period of the day in his perfected spiritual form. Thus he had lost all awareness of his physical body. Sanyasi Tako was captivated by Babaji's state and sat beside him, observing his sattvic abhavs, transcendental symptoms of ecstasy. Suddenly, Paramahamsa Babaji said to him, O Saki, silence Kakati at once, otherwise she will rouse Radha Govinda from their sleep of divine pleasure. Then Lalita Saki will become distressed and will rebuke me. Look there, Ananga Manjari is signaling for you to do this. You are Raman Manjari, and this is your designated service. Be attentive in this regard. After uttering these words, Paramahamsa Babaji fell unconscious. From that moment, Sanyasi Maharaj, now acquainted with his spiritual identity and service, engaged himself accordingly. Thus the day dawned, and the morning light spread its luster in the east. Birds began chirping melodiously in every direction, and a gentle breeze blew. The extraordinary beauty of the Madhavi grove of Pradyumna Kunja, illuminated by the crimson rays of the rising sun, was beyond description. Paramahamsa Babaji was seated on a cushion of banana bark. As he gradually regained external consciousness, he began to chant Sri Nam on his beads. Sanyasi Tako then offered prostrated obeisances at Babaji's feet, sat next to him, and with folded hands spoke with great humility. Prabhu, O Master, this destitute soul wishes to submit a question before you. Kindly reply and pacify my anguished heart. May you be pleased to infuse Brajaras into my heart, which has been scorched by the fire of Brahmagyan, knowledge aimed at the impersonal absolute, devoid of form, qualities and activities. Babaji replied, You are a fit candidate. Whatever questions you ask, I will answer as far as I am able. Sanyasi Thakur said, For a long time I have heard of the pre-eminence of Dharma. On numerous occasions I have asked the question, What is Dharma? to so many people. It is a cause of distress to me that the answers those people have given contradict each other. So please tell me, what is the true constitutional Dharma of the Jivas? And why do different teachers explain the nature of Dharma in such diverse ways. If Dharma is one, why don't all learned teachers cultivate that one universal Dharma, which is without a second? Paramahamsa Babaji meditated on the lotus feet of Bhagavan Sri Krishna Chaitanya and began to speak. O most fortunate one, I shall describe to you the principles of Dharma as far as my knowledge allows. An object is called a vastu, and its eternal nature is known as its nitya dharma. Nature arises from the elementary structure of an object. By Krishna's desire, when an object is formed, a particular nature is inherent in that structure as an eternal concomitant factor. This nature is the nitya dharma of the object. The nature of a given object becomes altered or distorted when a change takes place within it, either by force of circumstance or due to contact with other objects. With the passage of time, this distorted nature becomes fixed and appears to be permanent, as if it were the eternal nature of that object. This distorted nature is not the svabhav, true nature. It is called nisarga, that nature which is acquired through long-term association. This nisarga occupies the place of the factual nature and becomes identified as the svabhav. For example, water is an object, and its svabhav is liquidity. When water solidifies due to certain circumstances and becomes ice, the acquired nature of solidity takes the place of its inherent nature. In reality, this acquired nature is not eternal. Rather, it is occasional or temporary. It arises because of some cause, 
and when that cause is no longer effective, this acquired nature vanishes automatically. However, the svabhav is eternal. It may become distorted, but it still remains inseparably connected to its object, and the original nature will certainly become evident again when the proper time and circumstances arise. The svabhav of an object is its nitya dharma, eternal function, while its acquired nature is its naimitika dharma, occasional function. Those who have true knowledge of objects, vastu gyan, can know the difference between eternal and occasional function, whereas those who lack this knowledge consider acquired nature to be true nature, and they consequently mistake the temporary dharma for eternal dharma. What is it that is called Vastu, and what is the meaning of Svabhav? asked Sanyasi Thakur. Paramahamsa Babaji said, The word Vastu is derived from the Sanskrit verbal root Vas, which means to exist or to dwell. The verbal root becomes a noun when the suffix to is added. Therefore Vastu means that which has existence, or which is self-evident. There are two types of vastu, vastava and avastava. The term truly abiding substance, vastava vastu, refers to that which is grounded in transcendence. Temporary objects, avastava vastu, are dravya, solid objects, guna, qualities, and so on. Real objects have eternal existence. Unreal objects only have a semblance of existence which is sometimes real and sometimes unreal. It is said in the Srimad Bhagavatam 1.1.2 Vedyam Vastavam Atra Vastu Shivadam Only a truly abiding substance, which is related to the supreme absolute truth and which yields supreme auspiciousness, is worthy of being known. From this statement, it is clearly understood that the only real substance is that which is related to the Supreme Transcendence. Sri Bhagavan is the only real entity, Vastava Vastu. The living entity, Jiva, is a distinct or individual part of that entity, while Maya, the potency that produces illusion, is the energy of that entity. Therefore, the word Vastu refers to three fundamental principles, Bhagavan, the Jiva, and Maya. Knowledge of the mutual relationship between these three principles is known as pure knowledge, Shuddha Gyan. There are innumerable apparent representations of these three principles, and they are all regarded as avastava vastu, unreal substances. The classification of phenomena into various categories such as dravya, objects, and guna, qualities, which is undertaken by the Vaishasika school of philosophy, is merely a deliberation on the nature of avastavavastu, temporary objects. The special characteristic, Visheshgun, of any truly abiding substance is its factual nature. The jiva is a real entity, and his eternal characteristic quality is his true nature. Sanyasi Maharaj said, Prabhu, I want to understand this topic very clearly. Babaji Mahashai replied, Srila Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami, who was an object of the mercy of Sri Nityananda Prabhu, showed me a manuscript that he had written with his own hand. Sriman Mahaprabhu had instructed us on this subject in the book named Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. Jivera Swarup Hoy Krishnera Nityadas Krishnera Tatasta Shakti, Veda Abed Prakash. Madhya Lila 20, 108. The constitutional nature of the Jiva is to be an eternal servant of Sri Krishna. He is the marginal potency of Krishna and is a manifestation simultaneously one with him and different from him. Krishna Bhuli Se Jiva Anadi Bahir Muk. Ataiva Maya Tare Daya Samshara Duk Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya 20, 1, 17 The Jiva, who has forgotten Krishna, 
has been preoccupied with the external potency since time without beginning. Consequently, Krishna's illusory potency, Maya, gives him misery in the form of material existence. Krishna is the complete transcendental substance, Chit Vastu. He is often compared to the sun of the spiritual realm, and the jivas are compared to the sun's atomic particles of light. Jivas are innumerable. When it is said that they are individual parts of Krishna, it does not mean that they are like the pieces of stone that form a mountain. Although innumerable jiva portions emanate from Sri Krishna, he is not diminished by this in the slightest. For this reason, the Vedas have compared the jivas in one respect to sparks emanating from a fire. In reality, no adequate comparison can be made. No comparison, whether to sparks of a blazing fire, atomic particles within the rays of the sun, or gold produced from powerful mystic jewels, is completely appropriate. The true nature of the jiva is easily revealed in the heart, but only when the mundane conception of these comparisons is given up. Krishna is infinite spiritual substance, Brihat Chit Vastu, whereas the jivas are infinitesimal spiritual substance, Anu Chit Vastu. The oneness of Krishna and the jivas lies in their spiritual nature, Chit Dharma, but they are undoubtedly different as well, because their natures are complete and incomplete respectively. Krishna is the eternal lord of the jivas, and the jivas are Krishna's eternal servants. This interrelationship is natural. Krishna is the attractor, and the jivas are attracted. Krishna is the supreme ruler, and the jivas are ruled. Krishna is the observer, and the jivas are observed. Krishna is the complete whole, and the jivas are poor and insignificant. Krishna is the supreme powerful, whereas the jiva has no power. Therefore, the eternal svabhav or dharma of the jiva is Krishna dasya, eternal service and obedience to Krishna. Krishna is endowed with unlimited potencies. His complete potency, purna shakti, is perceived in the manifestation of the spiritual world, chit jagat. Similarly, his marginal potency is observed in the manifestation of the jivas. This special potency, known as Tatashta Shakti, accomplishes the function of the finite world, a Purna Jagat. The Tatashta Shakti, marginal potency, creates an entity, Vastu, that exists between the animate objects, Chid Vastu, and inanimate objects, Achid Vastu, and which can maintain a relationship with both the spiritual and material worlds. Purely transcendental entities are by nature quite the opposite of inanimate objects and therefore have no connection whatsoever with them. Although the jiva is an animate spiritual particle, he is capable of a relationship with inanimate matter because of the influence of the divine potency known as Tatasta Shakti. The boundary region between land and the water of a river is known as a tata, bank. This tata may be considered to be both land and water. In other words, it is situated in both. The divine Tatasta Shakti, which is situated in the border region, upholds the property of both land and water, as it were, in one existential entity. The jiva's nature is spiritual but still his composition is such that he can be controlled by dull matter, Jad Dharma. Therefore, the Bada Jiva, conditioned soul, is not beyond all connection with matter, unlike the Jivas in the spiritual domain, Shuddha Chit Jagat. Nonetheless, he is distinct from dull matter because of his animate spiritual nature. Since the Jiva is by nature different, from both the purely spiritual entities and dull matter, he is classified as a separate principle. Therefore, the eternal distinction between Bhagavan and the Jiva must be accepted. Bhagavan has full control over Maya, his external potency which creates illusion, for he is its supreme ruler. The Jiva, on the other hand, may under certain circumstances 
be controlled by Maya, for he is subject to its influence. Hence these three principles, Bhagavan, the Jiva and Maya, are real, Paramatika Satya, and eternal. Of these three, Bhagavan is the supreme eternal principle and is the foundation of the other principles. The following statement from the Sri Katha Upanishad 2.2.13 confirms this. Nityo Nityanam Chaitanas Chaitananam He is the supreme eternal amongst all eternals and the fundamental sentient being among all sentient beings. The jiva is by nature both an eternal servant of Krishna and the representation of his marginal potency. This demonstrates that the jiva is distinct from Bhagavan, yet at the same time is not separate from him. He is, therefore, a manifestation that is both different and non-different. Beda Bed Prakash The jiva is subject to domination by Maya, whereas Bhagavan is the controller of Maya. On the other hand, the jiva and Bhagavan are non-different because by their constitutional nature they are both transcendental entities, Chid Vastu. Moreover, the jiva is a special potency of Bhagavan. Herein lies the eternal non-distinction between these two. Where eternal distinction and non-distinction are found at one and the same time, eternal distinction takes prominence. The Nitya Dharma of the Jiva is servitorship to Krishna. When he forgets this, he is subjected to the tyranny of Maya, and from that very moment he becomes opposed to Krishna. The fall of the Jiva does not take place within the context of material time. Accordingly, the words Anadi Bahir Muk are used, meaning that the Jiva has been diverted since time without beginning. From the moment of this diversion and the jiva's entry into Maya, his nitya dharma becomes perverted. Therefore, by the association of Maya, the jiva develops nisarga, an acquired nature, which thus facilitates the display of his temporary function and disposition, naimitika dharma. The nitya dharma, eternal function, is one, indivisible and faultless in all different situations. But the Naimitika Dharma, temporary function, assumes many different forms when seen in diverse circumstances and when it is described in various ways by men of divergent opinions. Having spoken thus, Paramahamsa Babaji stopped and began to chant Sri Hari Nam Japa. Hearing this explanation of spiritual truths, Sanyasi Thakur offered prostrated obeisances and said, Prabhu, I shall deliberate on all these topics today. Tomorrow I shall submit at your lotus feet any questions that may arise. Thus ends the first chapter of Jaivadharma, entitled The Eternal and Temporary Dharmas of the Jiva.